Well, it's a while since I've preached to camera. Uh, it feels like being back in the pandemic, uh, but this is the message I brought uh, in Park End last Sunday and the recording didn't take, so I'm going to do it again now for the record. And we're preaching through Ephesians chapter 1, and today we're looking at the last four verses, uh, verses 20 to 23, which I'm going to read you now from the New International Version. So it begins like this. <clears throat> the power at work in us is the same as the mighty strength that God exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. <clears throat> now, often when you hear someone preach, they'll open with a kind of little story about their lives and show how it relates to what was in the Bible passage and the relevance of the passage to our lives. I can't really do that with this passage because... Uh, a lot of this is not relatable. When you think about, it talks about how God raised Christ from the dead and seized him at his right hand. And I can't say to you, oh, you know what it's like when you get raised to life by God and seated at his right hand. That's not in our experience. Um, it's about the world above this one and then the world beyond this one. So uh, I can't give you that kind of engaging opening. What we have to do is just leap right on to this moving horse as Paul is really up and running his firing on all cylinders and his pouring out undiluted theology which we want to try and get hold of here but you may say well Mike why bother doing that if we can't relate it to our lives what's the point in uh, understanding this at all and the answer is that it affects everything the way that we think affects everything that we do and everything that we are and what we understand of who God is is just enormously important uh, and that's why Paul, earlier in this passage, you might remember from uh, the previous message in this series, he, he's praised in Ephesians 1 verse 17, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you may know the hope to which he has called you and the glorious inheritance that we have with all the saints. And that really is what we want to pray for ourselves <clears throat> as we're going through this passage, as we start to look at really profound things. Uh, today we're going to look at how the resurrection happened, what the resurrection means, and then what it means that after the resurrection Christ sat down. We're going to look at the significance of where he sat down, and of what it means for him to be head of the church, and what it means for we, the church, to be his body. So there's a lot of substance in there, um, but I, I hope that as we come towards the end we'll see just how helpful it is for us to grasp all this. Um, so let's plough straight in, and I'm going to read that opening little section again. Uh, the power at work in us is the same as the mighty strength God exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. So I want to ask, first of all, how did the resurrection happen? And the, the Bible actually gives us several different models for understanding it. In this passage, it's described as God exerted his power. So God the Father exerted his power to raise God the Son from the grave. But somewhere else uh, in Acts 2, in fact, when Peter's preaching, he expresses it this way. He says, it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So in the way that Peter's looking at it here, it's Jesus himself, his own power, overcame the power of death. You imagine him kind of smashing his way out of the tomb because the tomb can't hold him down. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, there's, there's another perspective again. Uh, and the words here are this, <clears throat> are these. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Now what that's saying is, by implication, that because Christ has been raised, it follows that our faith is not futile and we are not in our sins. So what it's saying here is that the resurrection is how the Father showed us, demonstrated to us, that the sacrifice of Jesus was sufficient, that it was enough. <clears throat> now you may be asking, which of these three perspectives is the right one? Uh, and we haven't exhausted all the possibilities by any means. I'm sure there are loads of other theological perspectives on the, res on the resurrection. And the answer, of course, is, is that no one of them is the correct one in a way that excludes the others. The way 
to understand the resurrection, as it is with so many uh, profound biblical truths, is to encompass all of these different perspectives. Just as when we think, what's the church? And sometimes the Bible says it's like the bride of Christ, and sometimes it's the body of Christ, and sometimes it's the army of God, and sometimes it's the family. And we don't pick one of those and say, this is correct, the others are wrong. We take all of them together and they inform the way that we look at the church from all different directions to understand the whole shape of it. And in the same way, these three ways of looking at the resurrection all help us to understand more about what was going on and the significance of it. <clears throat> we really need to get straight in our heads what an astonishing thing the resurrection was. Not just a person who was dead being alive again, but, well, let me, uh, let's have C.S. Lewis explain it. Here's what he wrote in an essay called What Are We To Make Of Jesus Christ? Words of C.S. Lewis. I heard a man say, the importance of the resurrection is that it gives evidence of survival, evidence that the human personality survives death. On that view, what happened to Christ would be what has always happened to all men, the difference being that in Christ's case we were privileged to see it happening. But this is certainly not what the earliest Christian writers thought. Something perfectly new in the history of the universe had happened. Christ had defeated death. The door which had always been locked had for the very first time been forced open. Something new had appeared in the universe, as new as the first coming of organic life. So important, so much hangs on it. And that's why when we hear about other resurrections, that's not something we need to worry about. So what do I mean by that? Well, for example, there are other religions that have stories about people who were dead and who returned to life. Uh, there are well-attested uh, medical accounts, which you can read in peer-reviewed journals, if you like, uh, about people who have been pronounced dead and on occasion even um, put in their coffins and ready to be buried uh, and who subsequently revived. And that's known as Lazarus Syndrome. Uh, look up the Wikipedia article. It's interesting. Uh, and for that matter, even Lazarus himself. If you think about what happened to Lazarus, uh, he was maybe 30 years old. He died. Jesus brought him back to life in one of the great miracles in the New Testament. And yet, in another 40 years or so, presumably Lazarus just came to the end of his normal human life and he died again. So, what happened to him, I don't want to say it wasn't a big deal, it was a big deal. But ultimately it amounted only to extending the life he already had. But the resurrection of Jesus isn't about that. It's about making a whole new life that's completely different in quality to the life that we have now. Uh, Jesus' resurrection as well was the inauguration of a resurrection for all who follow him. So it's not just that it's greater in quality. It's not just that he was raised to a greater life than normal human life that he had lived for the 33 years before that. It's also that the resurrection of Jesus is greater in extent because it affects every one of us. It draws all of us up in its wake. Here's Paul again, this time in the first letters of the Corinthians, chapter 15. He says this. Since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ will all be made alive. Now, that's the doctrine of original sin, the first half of that, that because we're in Adam, sin is in us and death is in us. But the second half is saying that because of the resurrection of Jesus, he was the first fruits, if you like, of a great harvest of people who will be raised to life. And that's us. That's us. Which is why in the passage we're studying, to leap back to Ephesians 1, it's why Paul says um, that the power at work in us is the same as the mighty strength that God exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. It's the same power at work in us because the resurrection of Christ smashed open that door for all of us to go through. So what does the passage say after that? A surprising thing, I think. Let's read it again. Uh, the power at work in us is the same as the mighty strength that God exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at, the right, at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Now, what's the significance of sitting down? Well, we have uh, a thing out the back of our house which we call a lawn, but it's really a scarred, pitted, cratered wasteland assailed by moles um, and it, it's awful even just to walk across you you could I wouldn't never want to try and run across it I'd turn an ankle and mowing it as you can imagine 
is, is a horrible task. I'm um, just pushing it up and down little slopes and hills and over bumps and around molehills and it takes ages to do and it's exhausting and when I finish it I, I just go in and I sit down often with a, a nice cold drink. I sit down and what that means is the task is done. It means there's no more that remains to be done. In Bible language sitting down is what you do when your work is complete. And let me read you four uh, short examples of this, all from the book of Hebrews, that all make basically the same point. Uh, first one in Hebrews 1, verse 3. After Christ had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. <clears throat> then at the beginning of Hebrews 8, uh, he says, We have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. In Hebrews 10, verse 12, when this priest, that's Jesus, had offered for one time, for all time, one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Uh, and then, in case you think that the point hasn't been made firmly enough in Hebrews 12, and verse 2, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. There's a sense of completion. Let's look a little more closely at the version of this that we saw in Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, I'm going to read from verse 10, halfway through verse 10, through to the end of 14. Follow closely. We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Day after day, each priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So you see again the same pattern. Um, you've got priests who are doing things over and over again and who can't achieve that, that uh, sanctification and that purification from sins. And then Jesus, the great high priest, makes one sacrifice and then when that's done, when it's complete, he sits down. So when Paul, uh, back in Ephesians 1, writes that God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, he's saying two things. One is that the sacrifice has been accepted the second is that there's nothing more that needs to be done. It's so different from when I mow that lawn uh, because, you know, in another week, the, the grass or more to the point, the weeds are up again and need to be mowed again. Just like those priests in the Old Testament sacrificing animals day after day, week after week, year after year. Uh, and yet what would happen is they'd just go off and sin again, uh, as, as we all do in our imperfect human frames. So those sacrifices, you could say they didn't stick. And yet the one sacrifice that Jesus made sticks. It's complete. It's everything that's required. And that's why he then sits down. His work is done. Think about that phrase, uh, once and for all, that comes up in that passage. Uh, it turns up a lot, doesn't it, in everyday life. You hear it um, in newspaper headlines and all sorts of places. I think, for example, about the film version of Lord of the Rings and towards the end when Frodo's struggling up Mount Doom and the ring is becoming an intolerable burden and uh, he, he just can't go on. And uh, Sam says to him, his, his uh, assistant who's come with him, he says, then let's be rid of it once and for all, Mr. Frodo. And that phrase once and for all is so powerful. And it, this is where it's from, this passage in Hebrews. Uh, it's talking about Christ's sacrifice once and for all. And it's not saying one thing. Once and for all doesn't just mean do it and it's done. It's saying that it was done once and then it's done. And it was saying for all. In other words, for everybody. You could say one sacrifice made once for everybody, for all of us. That's what the phrase once and for all means. And by the way, if I could take another little digression... Notice a little tension at the end of that passage in Hebrews. For by one sacrifice, it says, Jesus has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Did you notice that? He has made perfect forever. He's done it. He's made us perfect. But who is he made perfect? Those who are being made holy. Same people. 
it's us, isn't it? So there is a, a level, a sense in which the work of Christ is absolutely done. And that's certainly the whole tenor of the passage we're looking at now. But it's also true that his work in us continues. So there's nothing else that needs to be done to break the power of sin. But in terms of our day-to-day -day lives and our becoming the people that he wants us to be and that we want to be and becoming the best versions of ourselves and living in a way that pleases God and makes us everything he intended us to be, that work goes on. Uh, and it's great to know that the same Jesus who has made, made us perfect forever is also at work in us who are being made holy. So now let's look at where Christ sat. I'm going to read you now verse 21 from uh, our passage. <clears throat> God seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Now, I... You could look at the, the implication of these words, and there's a sense in which when it says far above all rule and authority, there it may be referring to human powers, human rulers, human authority. And when it says above all power and dominion, that might be talking about spiritual powers, uh, angels and demons. But I, I, I'm not convinced that really a, a, a point is being made about two different kinds of power here. I think what we're seeing is just an emphasis of repeating the same idea over and over in different terms. Now, you see it all the time, don't you, in uh, the Psalms that are written in a way, uh, the words, the sounds of the words don't rhyme, but the meanings of the words do rhyme, if you like. So Psalm 1 says something like, blessed is he who, who doesn't sit in the seat of scoffers and who doesn't go around with the ungodly. And again, it's saying the same thing two different ways. So it's an emphasis. And you see this in various places in the Bible. And sometimes you see Instead of two parallel lines, you see three. But notice here, there are four. So where does Christ sit? He sits above all rule, above all authority, above all power, above all dominion. And to me, I feel like what's happening here is Paul is just smashing that idea home, that Jesus is above everything now, that the place where he's sat down, uh, as his work is complete, is above everything. And he hammers the point home by saying, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. So not just the present, but also the future, not just this life, but the next life. Uh, the point is that everything is covered. Uh, and that's nailed down even more explicitly in, in the hymn that Paul interpolates in Philippians chapter two, uh, which I'm sure will be familiar to lots of people. Starting in verse nine, it says this, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now that passage is very much like the one we've just read, uh, and the emphases are a little different. Uh, I like that. Again, we see the same truth from a couple of different angles. So in the Ephesians passage that we're looking at today, the big emphasis is all the things that Jesus is above, above rule and authority and power and dominion. But in the Philippians version, the emphasis is more on where he's powerful. And it says in heaven and on earth and under the earth, which I assume in, in context means hell. So there is nowhere in the whole cosmos, in the whole, uh, if you like, in the multiverse, where Jesus is not or will not be acknowledged, where a knee will not bow, where a tongue will not confess. What we have here is a glimpse of the total, total victory of Christ above every throne and power, above every planet and solar system and galaxy, in the present, in the future, a total victory. So that's a glimpse of the age to come. And as we approach the end of Ephesians 1 now, uh, we start to look a little bit about what the situation is now and what these great things to come imply for the lives that we live now. So uh, I'm going to read uh, verse 22. Uh, and God placed all things under Christ's feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now, here the wording is that Jesus is head over everything for the church. 
But elsewhere, we're told more straightforwardly that Jesus is the head of the church. Uh, for example, later in this very letter, Ephesians 5 verse 23, and it comes in Colossians as well. So there's this idea that Jesus is the head of the church and the church is the body of Jesus. Now, here's the really surprising thing about the verse we've just read. Read again this bit. Uh, the church is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now, Jesus is the one who fills everything in every way. But what's this fullness? What does that mean? It's a word that Bible translators have some trouble with. And it seems to be one of those words that uh, in the Greek have uh, several different meanings or maybe shades of meaning that are difficult to capture in a single English word. Uh, but one of the, the meanings is um, the complement of something. Now, I don't mean complement with an I, like when I say, oh, you're looking nice today. I mean complement with an E, which means the thing that goes with another thing. So when you grind spices, you have a pestle and a mortar. One of them is the bowl, the other is the, the uh, kind of grindy thing that you grind in the bowl. And if you just have the bowl, you can't grind spices. If you just have, I don't know which is the pestle and which is the mortar, that's why I'm saying things like grindy thing. But if you just have the grindy thing, again, the spices will just run all over the table. You need both. One is the complement of the other. Now, does that mean that Jesus without the church is lacking power or ineffective. Let's see uh, what Alfred Barry's commentary says about that. His, his, the way he expresses it. Thus, by a daring expression, St. Paul describes our Lord as conceiving his glorified humanity incomplete without his church. So there's a suggestion here that Jesus has chosen to work through the church now rather than directly in himself and that because of that choice is made, he's dependent on the church, he's dependent on us. Uh, I don't think Jesus needs to need the church, but I think he's chosen to need the church. And that's, it's a heavy responsibility, but also an extraordinary uh, privilege uh, so there's another one of these paradoxes, isn't it? Jesus, in a sense, doesn't need us at all. In another sense, he's chosen to need us. And we need to hold both of those things together at the same time and not be freaked out by them, just as uh, we are have been made perfect but are being made holy at the same time. Uh, there are lots of these things, lots of places where the Bible will express ideas that don't easily and straightforwardly fit into our heads and we need to be prepared to just step back and think a bit and look at them from different directions and not feel that we can boil them down into a single sentence that will perfectly encapsulate it better than the bible does we're not going to be able to do that so sometimes we just need to embrace that sense of tension and of complexity so in one sense we are only supplicants to christ we only come to him asking for things but in another sense we are his partners and we are at work for him in this world. So finally, I want to say this. Uh, we've lifted our eyes above the here and now. We've looked above every power and dominion and ruler and authority. And we've, we've glimpsed uh, past the end of this physical universe into the age to come. What does that mean for us now? What follows for right here and now? Well, what this passage tells us is that we, the church, are Christ's body on earth. So the question then becomes, how do we act as Christ's body? Well, one of the many answers is found in this very passage we've been looking at. Back in verse 15, which you remember we touched on in the first week, uh, Paul writes, Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. So that's what he writes to the Ephesian church. Uh, and what he's saying is two things, aren't there? That he's pleased to see their faith in the Lord Jesus is one thing or in other words their, their love for God himself and the second your love for all God's people your love for other people now I hope your spider sense is tingling and you're thinking this uh, pair of things sounds very familiar because we're, we're echoing back I think to the two greatest commandments that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 22 when he was asked what's the greatest commandment and he summarized from the Old Testament he said first love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So these are the two great commands that Jesus gave to his disciples. 
They're also the two marks that Paul looks for in the church that, that makes him want to give thanks for them. And I, I feel that they are the, the two essences of what we call to in our day-to-day -day lives. And it's noticeable that often the way that we love God is by loving others. You think about the parable of the sheep and the goats, Jesus tells in John's Gospel. I, I won't read it all now, it's, it's quite long. But uh, do you remember at the end of it when Jesus has said to people, uh, you clothed me when I was naked and fed me when I was hungry. They say, we never did any of those things. And his answer to them is, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. That's Matthew 25, verse 40. So there's an encouragement there for us, I think. All the things that we do in uh, loving other people it, uh, has great value in the loving other people in itself. But also beyond that, it's a way in which we express our love for God by loving those that he loves. You know, the body follows the head. We're not doing anything that Jesus hasn't done. We're not going anywhere he hasn't gone. When whatever we do for vulnerable people or for hurting people, or, or even for people who are feeling fine at the time, for that matter, uh, we're doing what Jesus did. And he led the way because he is our head and we are his body. And the body goes where the head leads. So that's a lot from uh, four verses at the end of Ephesians 1. Uh, I hope you'll agree that they're very, very dense verses. And I hope you'll agree that they were worth our time to really dig into them. And I, I hope as well that what comes out is, is not just uh, a greater glimpse of the age to come and of the greatness of the God that we follow, but also a call for us to live in a way where we are really fulfilling our, our identity as the body of that great head who's gone on before us. Loving God, loving other people.